Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, you know, I tell you, it's such an honor and privilege to be able to stand up here and, and preach God's word every Sunday and, and sing songs because God is, is worthy of songs and preach his word because I really believe that his word can do far more than anything Abram Kroger could ever do. And I appreciate what, what a good crowd we have here this morning for Back to Church Sunday. It's such a blessing and you know, we need the touch of the Lord. We need the touch of the Lord. And uh, this thing that we call church, this isn't my idea. This isn't your idea, but this is God's idea. And I hope and pray this morning uh, that you're hungry for God's word. And not not the, the words from my lips, but what God has put on my heart. See, I believe that the Holy Spirit has the ability to speak to you uh, and say things to you that I'm not even saying. There's something so powerful about the Word of God. And I want to share what He's laid on my heart this morning. So let's all stand for the reading of His Holy Word. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing Near. May God bless you, Mr. Holy Word. Let us pray. Dear Christmas, Father God, we are just so thankful to be in your house today, God. We are so thankful to be able to sing your praises. We are so thankful to be able to hear your word, God. And I just pray that you remove me from this pulpit this morning. Let your word fill the hearts of those that are listening, God. Those that are watching. Those that are hearing, God. And I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. We know that you are the God of wonder. The God of miracles, God. And I pray with all my heart this morning to give us a miracle. In Jesus' personal name, I pray. Amen. 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 Growing up, I was the third child in my family. When I was younger, there was only four of us. So I, was the, I was the third of four kids in my family. So that means a couple things. One, I was not the oldest. Two, I was not the youngest. I was the middle. Because I also wasn't the favorite. Well, I don't get into that. <laughs> I told my mom I'd stop telling everybody Aaron was her favorite. There are perks to being the oldest in the family. Uh, the oldest is, is a little bit more love because, uh, let's face it, the oldest is the guinea pig. The oldest, has, the oldest has to get thrown into situations and experiments because the parents don't know what they're doing. Uh, the youngest has its perks because the youngest is the baby. The baby doesn't know it. Even when he's 25 years old, he's still a baby. I tried to tell mom, Ace is not a baby, he's a grown man, but mom says Ace is still a baby. <laughs> uh, then you have me, I was in the middle. When you're in the middle, you have to sit in the middle. You stick in the middle car, in the middle seat in the car. That little seat isn't meant for somebody to sit in. Because <laughs> I don't care how, I was the tallest of my brothers. My legs were long, my brothers were short, and I still had to sit in the middle of a seat in the back that didn't fit me. <laughs> when you're in the middle child, your aunt, who's a teacher at the school, forgets you at the school. <laughs> <laughs> you're sitting there crying because even though you're the cutest, they still don't remember you. <laughs> And just like a 
family isn't perfect, and just like a family has the oldest and the youngest, and just like a family has their ups and downs, the same is true with the church. The church is made up of imperfect people who serve a perfect God. You know, I love morning. It's one of the things that I just, I love waking up because here's the thing, I sweat a lot, right? I'm just getting started preaching. I guarantee I'll be full of sweat. Everybody always talks about me sweating. I sweat a lot. I don't know what it is. I sweat. And so I love early mornings because it's cool and it's a little dark <coughs> and there's some fog out there and nobody's out in a mountain. It's just you and, and it's real calm and I just love that, that early morning. I love driving. I love, I love being out there and smelling the dew on the grass. It's one of my favorite things to do. But you see, here's the thing. There's a lot of people that are living uh, as if they're in that fog all the time. They're just living as if they're in that fog. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, one of the top flaws of car accidents is what? Fog. <coughs> because it helps you. It, it, it messes up your perception. Right? You lose visibility. And, and there's a lot of people who are living in this fog. When I wake up in the morning, because I don't understand the fog thing all the time. Because when I wake up in the morning, First thing that's in my head is uh, the SpongeBob song. It's the best day ever. <laughs> and if I'm really feeling good, if I'm like yesterday, I'm really feeling good. The Oklahoma song gets in my in my head. You know, uh, uh, oh what a beautiful morning. And uh, my family takes mornings. <laughs> Right? They understand that they're in this together. 
Yeah. They're in this together. First John 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7 says, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. See, the Bible is very clear. Love for others should be the mark of anyone who claims to follow Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus said, by this, everyone is going to know that you're my disciple. By what? By, by, by how? Because you love one another. The Bible even takes it a, a step further in James chapter 5, verse 9. James 5, 9 says, Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. See, we're supposed to let the peace of Christ rule all over. Right before Jesus was about to go to, on his way to the cross, he was having his last meeting with his disciples and followers. And he said, I have one commandment to give you, something I, I hope that you never, never forget. Love one another. <coughs> Love one another. I have one commandment to, to lead you, and I want you to love one another. Jesus was getting ready to die. He's like, love one another. Love one another. As Christians, we have to understand that's what we have to do. We have to love one another. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friend. So did you come here ready to love someone today? Did you come here today looking for a reason to love somebody, or did you just come here looking for a reason to be mad? I know some people come to church looking to be mad. They're, they're looking for flaws in the service. We'll you'll find them here, Trent. <laughs> I'm not a perfectionist, you know. I like to sing. I don't care what kids have. I'll preach with or without a microphone if I have to. You know, we have to understand that when you wake up out of bed, love should be on the forefront of your mind. Amen. We put as much energy in loving one another as we did gossiping and causing division and frustration. Our churches would be so big, so big you wouldn't even be able to have a building to contain it, all that love. See, this Thursday I was sitting in a, in a meeting with a, a group of people and we were talking about uh, cornhole, cornhole league. I'm sitting there listening to, to, to Brad and Colton talk about our new cornhole league. And I'm going to tell you, this pastor, this pastor left so happy Thursday listening to this cornhole league. I'm going to tell you why. Because they started out talking about the purpose of the cornhole league. You know what the purpose of the cornhole league is? It's not so Abram can brag about how good of a cornhole player he is. It's not, how, it's not for Abram to brag about how great him and Andrew are going to be when we begin the cornhole league. But it was about, listen to this, y'all are going to think this is crazy. Bringing the churches together. <laughs> Question, and, and the question was, what is 
your favorite hymn and why? And the majority of the people that answered, that they gave this particular hymn, and that their reasoning, though, was, was pretty much the same. If you really look at it, it was because it reminded them of a time when they assembled together, right? So, matter of fact, you know, this is my favorite hymn because we used to sing this at church in college. We used to sing this in church when I was a little girl. We used to sing this in church. You know, my grandma used to sing this in church. It's one of her favorite songs. And here's the thing that, that scares me because we have a generation that's growing up outside of church. They're not growing up in church. And I'm sitting here really reading these, these wonderful memories that people have of assembling together and singing hymns. And there's a generation that will never know about it. We don't do our part. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. So now instead of, uh, of having a, a generation of kids in church knowing that when times get tough, they have Jesus Christ there, or God's going to provide for them, or God's going to comfort them, or God's going to fight for them, we have a generation of kids who think drugs are, are the answers to numbing their pain. They think sexual relations are the way that they feel love. But I'm here to tell you those things are going to leave you more in And they're going to leave you more depressed. And they're going to leave you more destroyed. Church has failed a lot of people because we're missing out on the mission of our next generation. God's, God's word has been handed down from generation to generation to generation. And I'm going to tell you this. I, I'm going to tell you this today. I'm gonna, September 15th, 2019. Mark my words. Quote me. Put me on Twitter. Whatever you got to do. I promise you, while I'm alive, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure it gets passed on to the next. Amen. Because it's not going to stop at my generation. God's word cannot stop at my generation, especially as long as I'm living. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to use any means necessary, radio, television, whatever I need to get on, to make sure the next generation knows God's word. And I'm going to be honest with you, I, I, don't, like, I don't like dead churches. I don't like churches that are baby churches. I don't like churches that are, that are large churches and they water down the word to keep bringing people in. I want a church that is filled with people who are ready to go to war, who are ready to go out and march to the streets and take God's word to the masses. Amen. Amen. Tell people about what Jesus Christ has done for them. Tell people that Jesus Christ died for them and he rose again. And if we repent of our sins and turn our lives around, God's going to promise us a mansion just over that hill. And that bright land where we'll never grow old. This is a, a, not a message for us to keep. Like the Bible is not, it's not something for us just to hide out in our house and never take it out. It's for us to share with people. And we can't tell people if we don't go out and, and share it. We can't encourage people inside a church if we don't have people in the church. We gotta go out there and talk to people. We have to invite them. I don't want anybody in the family ever saying, I never knew who Jesus Christ was. I never even heard of who Jesus Christ was. I don't want anybody in the family. We should be reaching everybody. We shouldn't have the people in our backyard not even knowing who Jesus is. We have a, a challenge to do as a church. Which brings me to my, our last point. We need to encourage one another. If you've been following our sermons since I've been preaching, this has been probably a point in more sermons than I've ever, I, more than I can even count on my hand. Encourage one another. Point number two in my first sermon. Point number three in my 20th sermon. Point number one in my 45th sermon. I plan this. My, encouraging one another has been one of my points in all of my sermons because this is so important for us as Christians. We have to encourage one another. We have to let people know that God is still in control. No matter what we're going through in our lives, instead of us talking about one another, instead of us looking to get in and out on Sunday mornings, we're here to encourage one another. Because you never know, God may have brought you here to sin, to, to sit by somebody to encourage them this morning. God may have brought you here to sit by somebody who, who was thinking about harming themselves today, but find themselves here and they're sitting next to you and God put them in your path to encourage you. Even if it feels awkward or uncomfortable. You know, I went to this uh, mega church a couple years ago to hear this thing preach. And uh, it was a, a crazy experience. You walk, you drive into the parking lot and there's these, uh, I don't even know what you call them, parking lot encouragers. They yell at you. They yell at your car. You know? <laughs> I'm driving to the door. We're glad you're here, car. Um, what? Glad you're here. Yeah. What? <laughs> yell at the car. Whoa, we're pumped. We're so excited you're here. Oh, oh, what is it? <laughs> walk in there, and uh, I go to walk. I go to this big lobby. They have a nice lobby. I go to open the doors of the auditorium. They're 
pull up. So I, I was there a little early. So I opened the door to the auditorium, and a security guard comes at me. Hey! <laughs> Doors are closed till 9 o'clock. They're rehearsing in there. I said, rehearsing for what? Church. Church service? <laughs> we don't have church service here. We have worship experience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I said, all right. And, uh, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like waiting in line at this auditorium. <laughs> And a lady comes up to me real lovely, real happy. She's like, are you a first time visitor here? I said, no, I've been. Because see, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was, you know, <laughs> I was nervous. I said, no, lady, you should be ashamed of yourself. I'm here every week. <laughs> She's like, but if you're a first time, first time guest, I, I, we have goodie bags for you. We have a Starbucks coupon you can use at the counter over there. And uh, I said, no, I'm here all the time. But <laughs> the second line, the line started to get a little bigger behind me. It started to get some people behind me. And uh, an old lady, uh, I, she's probably 90 years old, 90, 95. She comes in here with uh, skinny jeans and an iPad for a Bible. And she said, this is your first time here? I said, how did you know? She said, you're wearing hats. You're overdressed. I said, oh. And uh, she said, let me give you one advice. As soon as those doors open, run. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, those doors open, fall comes barreling out of this auditorium, and I thought Jesus was going to come forward. I thought, I thought that was it. And, and people started pushing me from behind, pushing me, because they were trying to, they literally started running to the front seat. They wanted to get the best seat in the house. And so I, I'm going with them, I'm trying to run, and I can't see a thing because it's pitch black. All the chairs are blocked. Everything's blacked out. And I run into a camera that was... <laughs> but anyway, I hear, I hear this preacher, and, and he preaches, and uh, this guest preacher, a, a big, famous celebrity preacher, he comes and preaches. And uh, afterwards, this, this blew my mind. There were so many people, and the senior pastor just stood up in the front while people were leaving. And he was talking to some people, and I thought, that's pretty cool, the senior pastor uh, is going to talk to people. So I actually was going to make my way down there to talk to this uh, senior pastor, and I, I went down there, and, and uh, I was just going to kind of just mingle my way into the group, and whatever reason, everybody dispersed, and it was just me and him, and uh, I looked at him, he looked kind of sad, so I said, uh, if I thought this was a crazy experience, I don't know what he was thinking, so I said, uh, I'm praying for you, pastor, and he said, he looked at me and said, you know you're the first person today that said it. He said, I, he said, I came in here today, and I've been bombarded by complaints. I have been bombarded, bombarded by suggestions. People tell me how we should run our services, how we should do this, how we should do this. And he said, nobody has said hi to me or said that they're friends. Nobody. He said, I'm, I'm, he said, I'm the pastor of this, this thousands of people I've come in contact with every single day. Not one person said hi to me. So you're the first person to, to even acknowledge me. And he said, thank you for doing and, and, and it brought me a, just, it, being a pastor now, I understand what he's talking about. Everybody wants to yell, pastor. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> you know, you can't make everybody happy. But, you know, I, instead of looking at people and saying, you look stressed today, or looking at people and saying, you look upset today, you know, how about we encourage them? Tell them we're praying for them. Tell them we're excited to see them today. Tell them that, 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 that this senior pastor had so many problems that he had to face. And how nice it was for him to hear that somebody was thinking about him. We have to understand in Hebrews chapter 3, 13, it says, Encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Right? Encouragement. Every single day, encouragement must be consistent. We need to encourage every day because it is so powerful that somebody can overcome sin by it. And the wrath that is, that is going to overtake somebody's life, we need to encourage somebody. And here's the great thing. If we become encouragers, if we become people who seek to encourage those around us, the Bible says it will be given to you. Luke 6, 38 says, give, and it will be given to you. It says, pour into your lap of a measure, pressed down, shaken, and running over. For by your standard of measure will be measured to you in return. When you give peace, peace will come back. When, when, you, give, when you give encouragement, it will come back. That's what makes it so powerful to come together.
together. I've been, I've been watching, this is my last thing, I've been watching uh, uh, Hard Knocks on HBO. Hard Knocks, they go behind the scenes of a football team in the NFL. And there was a guy that really stood out to me. His name was Nathan Peterman. Now everybody, this kid, this guy's famous in the NFL world because of a mistake. He played a game for the Buffalo Bills. It was his rookie game. First time he's living out his dreams. He's in the good old time. He's finally made it to the NFL. He's finally getting to start because the original quarterback was injured. So this was it. His first year playing in the NFL, he was excited. He finally was able to play. This is the way he dreamt about. Interception. 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 He tied the worst rookie record for interception. <laughs> 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 Terrible. And so this plagued him the rest of his NFL career. He didn't play for But it's plagued him. He has been uh, nervous whenever he went to play. He's been afraid. He's been ashamed. He's been embarrassed. Because once you do stuff on that national stage, everybody talks about you for days. And uh, he's on this new team with the Oakland Raiders with Coach John Gruden. And, and uh, whatever reason, John Gruden likes the kid. And he's been pouring into him. And, and you watch you watch this from the very beginning of this, this, this show, where he was nervous and, and worried, to, to the end of the show where he's so confident. He's so confident. He's, he's ready to play football. He's ready to throw that football again. And, and the difference is encouragement. It took a coach who believed in him. It took a coach who was going to encourage him and say, I don't care what your past looks like. I'm going to be here for you today. And that's what we need to do as Christians. We all need encouragement. At the end of the day, this is why it's important for us to, to have Jesus Christ in our lives. Because it doesn't matter what happens. We have a Savior who sticks with us and stays by us. He is with us during the bad times, during the good times. We may have, have to encounter things that fight us. And, and encounter things that tear us down, but what makes it all doable is that the Lord is faithful until the end. The reason I get up every single day with a smile on my face is because I know Jesus Christ loves me. He loves me. And He loves you. And I can sit there and I can open up the Bible anywhere and I can see the peace and the promise that God gives us as Christians. And I believe every single bit because I believe in the authority of and I know that while I can go and I can visit the, the, the resting place of every religious prophet, I know that Jesus isn't where they laid him because he rose again. Amen. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, because why? I'm going to come again. Amen. Get my people. Will you be ready when Jesus comes again? Can you say without a shadow of doubt that you are going to? To be ready as we begin this time of invitation. There are some people that make this very difficult. There's churches and pastors that make this process very difficult. Believe in me. Believe in God. Believe also in me. This, this, this is the time where we can make that decision to receive Jesus Christ in your life. And you don't have to go through uh, extensive classes. You don't have to, this is a decision that you have to make right here where you're sitting. Come forward. See, I'm ready to make that decision. To repent of my sin. Maybe you just need to pray at the altar. You've been going through things this week, and you just need to pray. I guarantee somebody will come and pray for you. You just need to get it off your chest. Come pray at the altar. Maybe you want to make a decision to join this church and, and be on a, a church on the move. Whatever it is that God's going to do, I'm telling you this. Don't wait too long. Because Jesus said he's going to come back. And I believe he will. It's going to be a glorious day. And I can't wait until I'll be dancing and singing and nobody's going to say, calm down, man, bro.